a warm welcome to uh, Clark and Will Design Week, first of all, and a special welcome to the Chimera Showroom. We have a very special talk lined up for you this afternoon. Uh, we have a special uh, speaker, Dr. John Parkinson, who I'll introduce to you shortly. But uh, let me say a few words by way of introduction. My name is uh, Ian Byrne. I work in sustainability and marketing at Chimera. And just to set the, the context, uh, when we talk about revolution in textiles, we think of the industrial revolution. And that takes us back to that period of rapid industrialization from about 760 onwards. For all these inventions uh, such as the flying shuttle, the spinning jenny, power looms, and all of a sudden this process of uh, take, make, and waste as this linear process of manufacturing began. And in the process, of course, that created a load of uh, waste and a load of pollution and a load of problems. And we're now in the digital age and the digital revolution of AI is upon us. So I thought I'd actually ask ChatGPT for some statistics about uh, the world of uh, global textile production. And ChatGPT told me that uh, on an annual basis, 92 million tons of textile waste are produced. Textile production is responsible for 20% of industrial water pollution and 8% of greenhouse gas emissions are attributed to textiles, which is more than international air travel and maritime shipping. As we enter the next industrial revolution, uh, we're trying to break this uh, take, make, waste linear process and we're enter entering into the circular economy. And if you follow Ellen MacArthur, then there are two sides of the circular economy. There's the biological cycle, which is the natural, sustainable, renewable cycle of, uh, of, of, of plant-based raw materials and, and wool. And then we have the technical cycle, which is uh, the recycled uh, cycle. And that's what uh, John is going to share with us, uh, his experience in a world of wool textile recycling. And John, John was born in Dewsbury, the center of the Yorkshire and UK wool textile recycling industry. And he really grew up into textiles. He began helping and then working alongside his father in the 1970s, 1980s and then set up his own pioneering textile recycling business, Evergreen, in 1990. Evergreen, unfortunately, closed in about 1995. And then John enjoyed a second uh, career, retrained and spent nearly 20 years in applied theater and education. I'm sure he'll talk to you a little bit more about that as well. But his passion for recycling and for textiles was undiminished, and when the world caught up with his original idea. In 2019, John co-founded a company called Inuio together with his wife, Linda. And Inuio became part of the Chimera group of companies in 2022. And it's since then that we've had an enormous uh, privilege to work alongside John and to really understand John's knowledge, expertise, and his talent and above all, his passion for wool textile recycling. So I'll hand over now to Dr. Parkinson. Thanks very much for everybody for, for turning up to listen. Um, apologies, because I've seen some um, faces that I've known before. So apologies for those that served me talk before. History doesn't really change that much. But uh, what we're doing with Chimera is, uh, is kind of taking the history and moving it into a new era. So that's the, the relevance of it for today. So uh, it's great to be talking about a revolution and as you say, industrial revolution and all that. And quite a, quite a, a good idea with the revolution being a full turn and the cycles and the circles and all that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna try and take you through 200 years of mechanical textile recycling that first began in West Yorkshire in a little place just outside, a little place called Batley or just outside uh, Batley. We start off by why are we here, what we're doing, and this is Inuio and Chimera coming together. And uh, you'll see more as I talk about how that, um, how that happened. Um, but we've got our expertise, which is traditional mechanical textile recycling in Yorkshire, which is a 
particular way of recovering worn cashmere fibers um, from, from waste materials. And Chimera, that had an ambition to, um, to be able to work with this, and we happened to have um, uh, the, the machinery and the know-how, and we were lucky enough to find Chimera that could um, do the sorts of things that they're doing now. So that's putting these, these two businesses together, Inuio and Chimera. By the way, Inuio, strange sounding name. It, it's, it, it's an acronym. So when I was trying to first start, I was thinking about coming back to trade after 30 odd years. I never thought I'd come back to trade. Never thought we'd be able to come back to us passion. So how do I get that in one word? And also thinking about waste. It's a raw material, it's not really waste. So it's, it's not over for it. And I'm always telling my kids, you know, like if, if you're not bright, it's button in tin, stick at it, because tenacity will make up for a lot. So I'm always saying to them, it's in the Yorkshire dialect, you ought to have subtitles. I'll, I'll be as posh as I can. In the Yorkshire dialect, it, well, it's never over until it's over. But I tried to put that into company's house uh, with a single eye on each side. And who would have a name like that? Somebody must have. They said you can't have it. Somebody's got a name that's close to it. So I just went with it. It is never over until it is over. And it clicked. There might have been some red wine involved. It clicked. And I, I went, yeah, I'll have it. And so we, we became a new wheel. And uh, so if nothing else, it's strange, but it's, it's a conversation piece. And it, and it does say everything we want to say about the business. So we're going to go back uh, circa oh, the early 1800s. Some of the historians said that a man called Benjamin Law, Law first had the idea of recovering wool from old wool to be able to be repurposed into cloth again around 1807 when he visited a saddler's shop in London. And it was a London textile fair. He'd gone down with his agent and he'd gone down also with uh, his partner. And, uh, but he, he called in the saddler's shop because he was a friend of his and he saw this stuff sticking out of saddles. So there must have been grinding wool up, I believe in Brighouse, near Wakefield, before that time, but only for filling things. And he twiddled it in his hands like we do in textiles. And, I can spin I can spin this. And he asked he asked the, 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 the saddler, how much does it cost this this stuff? And in the words of my son, oh it's ten bob and a jaffa cake, which means not very much. So he says, Bring me some bells. And and he had them delivered in secret. And for years and years in secret he perfected. So the, the old it's called Shoddy and Mungo trade, which is where you can see there, Shoddy and Mungo. That's still in Dewsbury Town Centre as it's the only kind of one of the few remaining uh, buildings with, with that terminology on it. Uh, shoddy, fibres recovered from knitted garments. Mungo, fibres recovered from woven garments. And uh, so he, he uh, perfected eventually. We thought 1812, 1830, he just about made a piece of cloth that was saleable. But he kept it all quiet. And there are so many stories that I haven't got time to tell you now. But just like so many people that discover things that are inventors, they don't always... They don't always get the, the benefit, and uh, he, uh, he sent his son out because he didn't want people to know that he was, uh, what, what his secret was, that he was getting old clothes that was cheaper than new wool and dyed new wool because he was sorting it into different colours so he didn't dye. He sent his son out to America to sell it. His son came back a hero. He'd sold this in the family, but they were keeping it quiet still. And he said to his son, right, we're going we're gonna to fill a boat up now and you can go and sell all this stuff to America and we'll be minted. His son says, I won't go. And we don't know why he won't go. The historians can't explain it. We wonder whether it might have been a girl in America last time that he didn't want to see again. Perhaps a girl in Batley that he didn't want to leave. We're not really sure. But he, he apparently said to his friends, I won't come back. He didn't come back. And this is in early 1800s. And when he didn't, his father, Benjamin, went to New York, asked around, and said, well, there was a guy here who was younger than you, but he looked like you. He had a, a wad full of cash. And a funny accent, a bit like yours, but he's gone down to New Orleans for a good time. Apparently, yellow fever were raging down there. Benjamin never went, came home a broken man, and the agent and partners that he'd gone down to London with, that he kept his secret from, he discovered his secret. First shoddy mill in Batley ever to be built in the world, and uh, he lost his impetus, and they all made the money, and he didn't. There you go. Um, fast forward now, because the, 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 the shoddy trade flourished. Towns all around Dewsbury, Batley, Osset, Morley, Huddersfield um, had shoddy manufacturers and rag merchants. It weren't the charities that collected. It was 
tatters, rag and bone men that were collected, and all that went into marine stores, sold them scrap yards now, and rag merchants would buy these woolen garments and woven and knitted and sort into about 40 or 50 different shades that shoddy manufacturers could buy. Five ton of this, two ton of that, all sorted, all with the buttons taken off and the zips taken off. And these, there were, there were many hundreds, so many that in Osset, motto is, their, their claim to fame was that they had a rag merchant on every street corner and their motto is useless things by art made useful, which is what the shoddy trade do. It's in Latin, so I don't know the Latin thing, but that's when it's converted into English. Um, but, and they, because they flourished and because they were making a cheaper cloth, because then wool was expensive, processing was cheap, wages and conditions, it's the opposite way around now, wool's cheap and, and the processing is expensive. Um, it flourished so much and they made cheap cloth for the world and uh, lots of the, the, the mills uh, around the Yorkshire area um, did fabulous business and made many millions of metres of cloth. By the end of um, World War II, um, the trade started to diminish and uh, the mills started to shut and um, it, it, it looked as though there wouldn't be a shoddy trade anymore. But some people said that the, the trade was, was finished and to a large extent it was diminishing so much. Um, but in 1970, my dad started his own place. I went to work with him. And in, in 1995, we started a business called Evergreen, which is, which is the thing that you can see there. And Evergreen was to try and keep the industry alive. Instead of keeping the secrets, we wanted to tell people about how fabulous recycled wool could be and the benefits and the environmental benefits. We received a lot of publication, a lot of media interest, and we were on telly, you know, people in here can remember the clothes show, but we were on the clothes show and Jeff Banks came to our mill and had a look. And um, we, were, we were selling to people like Esprit who had a collection and uh, some of the high street would take stuff, Debenhams and Tesco's and people like that. Um, but there weren't enough um, trade to keep us going the whole time. But we had five years whereby we did at least introduce the world to the possibilities of recycled wool done the way that we do it. And this is this, this next bit of video. It, it's a heart back to 30 odd years ago. Shoddy is a textile term describing old material that's been reprocessed into new fabric. It was a business that thrived for 150 years until fashions changed and the market for thick or shoddy material collapsed. Most of the shoddy manufacturers went bust and to survive meant change. So here in Dewsbury, Colin Parkinson Shoddy and Waste became evergreen, fashion from recycled fabrics with the emphasis on the environment. From the early days, it was a commercial decision to keep in business. But from, from there, we were able to develop new things using detergents that were less harmful, actually taking on the carding and the spinning ourselves, ensuring that right through to finished cloth and into knitting yarn, that every stage of, being, um, every stage of production uh, have been designed to minimise the impact on the environment. And from what starts off as being a, 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 a commercial decision to stay in business becomes almost, uh, uh, it starts to take over your life and becomes a, a crusade almost. Into colours and type. To John, whose father had the original shoddy business here, these are more than just rags. To me, we still use the word waste, but it isn't. I mean, you can, you know, I can see a, a, a batch of rags and if it's a really particularly nice, I can get very excited about it. And they're beautiful, gorgeous rags and you can, you can start to get quite enthusiastic. And sometimes um, there's a delivery being made and you inspect a bale and you, you, get, you get really carried away and you feel like you could roll about in it, it's gorgeous. And, and people, you know, what's, what, what's, what, what's the matter with him? But it's, it's that love and, and of, of, of the raw materials and knowing, being able to tell one batch from another batch instantly and seeing the beauty in it. And there's a, a tremendous beauty in, in, in textile waste and raw materials. The rags are shredded, then reconstituted into yarn, which is carded, spun, and then taken to local weavers to be woven into fabric. There's been no shortage of investment at Evergreen, and it's meant a lot of risks for John. He's experimented with different raw materials, and he's now working with recycled silk, cashmere, denim, and even hemp. One of the big kicks is the fact that you are doing something 
different, you are doing something new. And now it's great when people come from all over the world, Hong Kong, America and Canada and all over, people say, oh, I've heard so-and-so were talking about you in this part of the world and so-and-so. And everybody knows, you know, in the design, anybody working in green knows that they all know Evergreen. And that's great. And it's almost like embarrassing. You almost, it makes you laugh. You think, well, tiny little, tiny little those in Batley car and people are talking about us all over the world in design about who's working with the eco fashion and Evergreen always comes up and that's, that's great. So we're doing something, we're making an impact. It's starting to happen. But little by little, I got drawn in, and I went back to the trade to, to have a look, and the last traditional shoddy manufacturer closed in 2000. And so, it was, it was kind of a, a weird thing. It was, what do I do about this? I've got the knowledge and the expertise. We've, we've done it before. We've made new stuff from old stuff, and we're at great risk of losing all those skills, all that heritage, all that vocabulary. And um, so... Um, at first, I was just going to, being a bit of an history nerd, I was just going to tell the stories of the history of the trade. Um, but um, little by little, you, you know, you get drawn in and you think, well, the real test is to be able to actually do it, is to actually recycle stuff. So we put a, a bid in for um, a machinery and a bid in for some research and development. Not thinking that, I'd, you know, think, oh, I've put my bid in, so that's it, because I'll never win that, but we won both. So oh, now, now I've got, I've got to do something. Now I had to pack my teacher's job in and think about how are we gonna how are we gonna do this? Um, we got the new newer new old logo. The logo was taken from when my daughter, when we first started Evergreen, she'd drawn a, a tree on a flower for our swing tag with a, a folk song that was leave them. So we kept that, and uh, and, so, and 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 we got the new old thing, and uh, we decided to launch a craft range. Um, we're using some machinery that wasn't really well designed for uh, for what we wanted to do, but made a start until I got this new machinery in. So we were going to put this new machinery um, into a mill. One or two things didn't work out the way that we wanted, and so we had to find another partner. And uh, luckily, we found uh, we found Primera. Um And uh, so we, we we needed a home because we're not we didn't have a big mill to put it in a home um, for the machine. So, so Neil Leo then changed its logo and became part of Camera uh, to uh, to my wife's great dismay because I'd already had Camera tattooed on my arm, and Linda says that'll be another two hundred quid for other arm now, won't it? It weren't I done. I had the other, other bit done. So we we ch we changed. You got to carry on, aren't you? We've done that. So we changed it. We changed it over and became a new Leo, and we joined together. Um, with Chimera in March 2022. And together we're uh, committed to, um, as it says, advancing circularity, um, the, the, uh, the things that anyway I can bring to the party and the things that uh, Chimera uh, can work with us on. And um, today we've got Revolution, which um, we only got the machinery in last August in the, in the place. Um, so to be launching Revolution now is, is, is quite a thing, it's a lot faster than, see I've only just got to know Camera, and I thought, well that sounds about, oh, normally it'd be about 18 months to get from, you know, starting point to, to launch, so an amazing thing to get this far, and um, uh, and who knows where it's where it's gonna go um, in the future as we, as, as we work with um, new materials, new blends, new colors, new collections. Um, so, um, as I, as I mentioned earlier, this was the sort of kind of publicity that we got with, um, with, with Evergreen that now Camera have also found. Certainly the media um, pick up on, on what we're doing and, um, and how we're taking old stuff and bringing it into, into the new. And even though there's this 200 year story that we've talked about now, um, one thing that I always want to explain to people that you're not, not part of this story. Just by being here, you're part of this story. Camera definitely are. People who are, who are the customers, people who supply them, all become part of this story that's resurrecting this, I call it an endangered species, if you're gonna use that, you know, the old shoddy trade, and, and re-energize it. Certainly, um, for the uh, uh, setup that we've got now, um, the, the, there's, there's so many more things that can be done, but to get 
to this point where that industry can be saved is, uh, is a wonderful thing. So um, the next slide um, shows the, uh, the machinery in action, explains a little bit just by uh, the, the text that comes up on the screen, what's happening at different points. There we go. So um, we, uh, Inubio works with um, other retailers and collaborators. We, um, we recycle material for other UK manufacturers. So weavers, we take their salvage and open it back up, make it into new wool, make it into yarn. It starts a new life, make it into fabrics. We're working with some UK knitters. We work with online retailers and their take-back schemes from their customers. Their customers get a discount. We recycle it, make it into new stuff. We act as a research and development um, centre as well, as well as recycling. It just leaves me to say thank you for listening.